you and welcome, everybody. You are part of one of the largest uh, Bible classes in the world. Not only do we uh, minister uh, right here, but it goes through the eye of the television and cable vision in many, many places throughout the world. And so we are learning and they are learning, and we're rejoicing together for the mighty power of God that helps us in these last days to know the truth, because Jesus said it's the truth that sets us free. And no greater truth does man need to know than who man is. It is simply remarkable to me that through his science man can walk on the moon, and those same men come back and divorce their wives, uh, they come back and break up their families, they come back and find great emotional turmoil. Uh, man uh, understands science but does not understand himself. They're working at it. You better believe it. May I bless you. We, we thank you for the privilege of teaching the truth. Bless these that have come to learn. And may their spirits be filled. And may their, their minds conform to the image of God. And for your blessings, we thank you. Amen. And the total man, of which we are studying, very diligently, by the way, uh, we, at this point, are studying the chemistry of the soul, of, of the human soul. Uh, man is struggling also to understand this. As science is searching uh, the human soul for truth. Uh, they, they are reaching out to the mind to say, we'd like to understand you. And they're discovering some things. They're discovering, for example, the human mind reacts by blood pressure. For example, the, the, the lie detector. Uh, men have come to know that lying is unnatural for the human personality. that <laughs> Man was built to tell the truth and that, uh, that lying breaks down the fabric of the moral tissues uh, within the human personality and that God knows what's inside of a man. He even knows what he's thinking, much less what he is saying. And so God has made a discovery of the thoughts of man, that he knows what man is thinking about. And men would like to know. And so they set up lie detectors, and when you tell a lie, it, it pushes the blood pressure up, and they say, uh-huh, he's told a lie. And if he's telling the truth, his blood pressure remains about the same. Well, God can go further than blood pressure. He can go to the innermost parts of the person, even down deep into the thought life, even to the intense life, and know there what is taking place. In the realm of the spirit, we get to know the soul of man through the gifts of the spirit. The gift called the gift, the gift of the discerning of spirits uh, will discern inside of a person and seeks and searches out his soul to know what's going on in there. And we will go into that a little more here uh, very shortly. Uh, what are the works of the soul? For example, a, a man's soulish forces uh, have been active throughout the, the millennia not only the centuries, but the millennia. For example, uh, it was man's solical being which created and, and made the Tower of Babel, the Tower of Babel uh, after the flood. Uh, this Tower of Babel that man conceived in his own mind was, his, was to be his own deliverance. He was to tell God, send a flood if you want to, we'll climb our tower, and you'll never be able to get us. Man is always, with his mind, wanting to seek out that which God did not want him to seek out. And the result of the Tower of Babel, as all of us know, about 3,000 languages in the world, and these 3,000 languages created chaos, and created confusion, and created conflict of tongues. And until this moment, until this very day, uh, tongues is a barrier. And, and uh, when you meet a person, you can't communicate with him, then there's a barrier there. Or if he speaks your language but lisps when he speaks, or, or doesn't pronounce it according to your area in, in, which you are, in which you live, it becomes a barrier of friendship <laughs> and, 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 many other, and many other problems that it can bring. Now, on the other hand, it was man's spirit, not his soul, that built... Uh, Noah's Ark, you see. It was another building project, but one created 
out of man's soul and created chaos, and the other created out of man's spirit. Uh, God communicated to Noah through his spirit and said man must be judged because of his sins. I have promised that I would bring a deliverer to the world and, and that this deliverer would uh, set the world free. Uh, he will be a Messiah. And you must build an ark of protection and an ark uh, of safety that will go across the calamity. There will be calamity, but this will go across the calamity and I'll tell you how to build it. And so this building job, uh, rather than damning the world and hurting the world, it preserves salvation for mankind, that through Noah the world has salvation. And so mankind and the animal kingdom uh, were preserved for a posterity uh, through a building project called the ark. So God is not against building, he's against building in the solical parts that has to do with your mind without God, or the building in the spiritual parts that has to do with, with the growth of the spirit of man and doing the things from God's point of view rather than the devil's point of view, which goes through the solical area. Now, a, a very good example of this uh, chemistry of the soul uh, has to do with uh, Israel's first king. And one ought to study it very carefully uh, in, in order to uh, say, now, now here's what it means by uh, uh, making your life conform either to the spirit or, or to the soul. Let's begin with it. Uh, king Saul, being the first king in, among the Israelite people, uh, in the beginning lived and walked by his spirit. Now in 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 6, it says, And the spirit of Jehovah will come upon you, now, this was the prophet speaking to the king, and you shall prophesy with the prophets. You should prophesy with them. And you shall be turned into another man. <laughs> now, that, that's, that's, that's what the Bible says. And, and so he was to receive a new heart. This means he began in the spirit. Uh, he was to prophesy, which is of the spirit. Uh, let's, let's read a little further. And it says, And let it be that when these signs come unto you, that, that you do as occasion serve thee. And for God is with you now. God is with you. You see, that's, that's living, moving in the spirit of man. And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and I will come upon you down there and to offer burnt offerings and to do sacrifice of peace offerings. Seven days shall you tarry till I come to you and show you what thou shalt do. Now this was the prophet Samuel talking to the new king of England. And so it was that when, Saul, when Samuel turned his back when Saul turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave King Saul another heart. Now that's the spirit, you see. God gave him another heart, and all those signs came to pass that day. And so here was a man who began in the spirit. He began moving by the power of God. He began moving in the way that we ought to move. God directing our lives, God promoting our lives, God showing us the things. He began right. But uh, any time you begin right, the devil doesn't want you to stay right. Uh, the devil wants you to get off into your humanistic uh, manner of living. He wants you to go back into your Adamic principles of rebellion. And that's what it means. Uh, the Adamic nature is rebellion against God, saying, listen, God, we'll do as we please, and we won't do as you tell us to do. And so King Saul, in 1 Samuel chapter 13, beginning of verse 13, Samuel said to King Saul, Thou hast done foolishly, neighbor, when you live by your solical parts and you let your life be dominated by your solical parts, the Bible says you live foolishly. Isn't that amazing? The Bible says you live foolishly. Now, if the Bible calls it foolishness, <laughs> you better believe it. And let us not live by our solical elements because they are of the Adamic nature. They are, they are of the spirit of rebellion. And they are the separators from the living God and from peace in our hearts and joy in our lives. They're real separators. And God says, don't do it. The, the prophet Samuel said to the king, you've done foolishly in that you have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now could the Lord have established your kingdom upon Israel forever. Huh, isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? God gives you a position, you know. God can say you can have this job forever. How you can have this position forever. Unless 
unless you come against me, unless you provoke me to anger, unless you rebel against me, and then you break the covenant under which we're laboring. You, 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 you break the covenant under which we're operating. And he says, that cannot be done. Yeah, that must not be done. Verse 14 says, but now, isn't that, isn't that too bad they had to have verse 14? But now, this is 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14. Now your kingdom shall not continue. Now you see, visibly, it continued for a few years after that, you know. But you can't believe those things. You may look like you're getting along all right out of the will of God, but you're not. Uh, the, the wheels of God sometimes don't grind fast. The, 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 we, we hear that they grind exceedingly small. And, and so it's better to love God and to serve God and to worship God and to move with God than it is to live in your solical being, the chemistry of the soul. And now, in your solical being, your kingdom will not continue. God has sought him a man after his own heart. God went looking for another man. And the Lord hath commanded him to be the captain over his people because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. Now, now what happened to him? In 1 Samuel 15, you find that uh, when he came back, he says, uh, the wealth that you see here, the people told me to bring back. See, he even lied about it. He blamed it on the people. Anytime you blame anything on the people, uh, that means you're, you're trying to run from your own responsibility. Uh, his eyes, or his body, saw the wealth, the gold, the silver, the beautiful raiment, and so forth, and he wanted it. His solical pride saw King Agag and says, I'll bring him back as a trophy. I'll bring back a trophy. And so he saw King Agag and said, I'll bring him back. But when Samuel met him, uh, Samuel called it rebellion. And in verse 23 of chapter 15, he said, now, now listen, King Saul, rebellion is as bad as witchcraft. And he said, God, it said, it's better to obey God than it is to offer a sacrifice. You say these cows are for a sacrifice, but God, God wants uh, uh, obedience more than he wants sacrifice. Some people are willing to give God something and then stay away from church or go somewhere where they shouldn't go. And you think that giving God a, 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 a gift, you know, will calm him down. Uh, you better read the Bible. God says obedience is better than sacrifice. And that when you obey him, it's better than giving to him. Walk in his ways and do as he said to. And so uh, the prophet says rebellion is worse than witchcraft. And that means rebellion is worse than just worshiping the devil. That's, that's, that's terrible. You say, now what happened to this soul in conflict in studying the chemistry of his soul? When this man uh, revolted against God, notice what happened to him. Number one, according to the Bible, he became depressed. He became so sad. He became so sad until they sent throughout the whole land getting people to play musical instruments and sing in his presence, hoping to take the sadness away from him. So he became a depressed person. Depression is not from God. It's a solical situation that belongs to the human mind and has no relationship with God, with God's blessing and God's power. <laughs> so when you're depressed, don't blame it on God. God is not a depressor and God does not depress people. Sin depresses people and the, the, your solical nature in rebellion against God depresses people. Find out from where your depression comes and discover it has no relationship with the divine precepts of God, has no relationship with loving and serving God. He became depressed. You want to see his next stage? Hate came into his heart against his successor, who was David. He felt inside of him that David would get his job, and he began to hate. Now, hate is a thing of the soul. Hate is love gone sour, moving from the spirit of man into the soul of man. <laughs> and so when you, the, the same instrument you love with, you hate with, it's, on, it's gone negative. Uh, the, the, the spirit within you that, that should cause you to love, it moves over into the other side and to an area called dislike, and, and, and you hate. Hate gives birth, the Bible says, to murder. And, and, and Saul took his javelin, and, and tried to kill David. Then he took his sword and went after him in the field and says, I will kill you. And I think that's very interesting there to see uh, how the solical parts work without God. They first depressed and then they hate and then they murder and they end up in witchcraft. When he could not get anything from God, he went over to the witch and said, say, gal, you got anything from God for me? What's God going to do to me? Am I going to die or live? And so that's the way 
the soulical parts of a person can lead a person clear outside of the will of God. Now we have seen that the human mind is a department of the human soul. It's one of the most important parts of the human personality. In Romans 1, 28, God says that man, without God, without the Bible, without the Spirit, that that man, that man has within him a reprobate mind as part of your soul. A reprobate mind. A mind that is in absolute anger with God, a mind that is set against God, a mind that is, has gone into the dirt of sin and, 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 and confusion away from God, and man without God is possessed with what we call a reprobate mind. And it has to be changed by God's supernatural power to ever be anything else other than that. In Romans 1, 28, it says, and if they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, that's speaking of the nations of the world, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. You see, uh, when you refuse God, you always pick up the opposite. When a man won't be spiritual, he, he becomes carnal. There's no middle ground, I mean. And either you have a mind subject to the Spirit and a mind subject to the laws of God and subject to obedience to God, or you have a, a reprobate mind. There's no middle ground there. And we have to decide, are we going to function in our humanistic mind? Are we going to function in our, in, in our divinely uh, in, in grafted spirit? We have to decide where, and many Christians live in their reprobate mind. It's bad, isn't it? God has given you the new birth, and rather than living in that spirit, I, you've moved over into this thing, saying, I don't want to retain God in, in my knowledge whatsoever. In Romans 8 and 7, it says, the mind is carnal. The human mind is carnal, and it is not subject to the law of God. That's because you're born that way with the Adamic mind. And that's the reason you have to have the rebirth of the spirit and the spirit takes control over the mind and says, mind, I command you to live as I say live. I command you to do as I say do. And the mind becomes a servant of the spirit. As long as your mind is a king, you're gonna go the wrong way. But when your mind becomes a servant and serves your spirit, it's gonna do the right thing. It isn't easy to study our inward parts, <laughs> our part beyond our human vision apart beyond our human hearing uh, on the inside of us is that inner man and this is the part we must really dissect and look into and say from whence cometh all my all my actions and all my feelings and all these things from where do they come they come from one or two sources they either come from your non-born again nature of your adamic carnal being or they come from your born again nature where God puts in you his righteousness his peace and his joy or it floods to that and you make the deciding factor that where are your decisions coming from and where are your actions coming from you'll have to decide whether they come up out of your spirit or up out of your soul and if they come up out of your soul the Bible says here they are carnal and not subject to the law of God that's Romans 8 and 7 because a carnal mind is enmity against God you see your natural mind uh, because of Adam has a hatred toward God. It, it's just there. It's an, it's an anger against God. It's in warfare against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. No, no sinner can ever live in great peace with God. That is not possible. Uh, no unregenerate person can ever live in the, in, in the glow of the Spirit. That is not possible. You can only live in the Spirit by getting born of the Spirit. And you can only walk with God when your feet are, are shod with the preparation of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the beginning of the new man is a born-again experience. And from there, your, your spirit nature begins to dominate your life. And, and the power of God comes into you. And your soul becomes, uh, and your mind uh, becomes a servant. A servant rather than a king uh, to make any decisions. In Ephesians 4 and 7, the great apostle said these words. This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as nations or Gentiles, as they walk, because they walk in the vanity of their mind. The unregenerate person walks in the vainness of his mind. Now, you only have to study human beings a very short time to, to see how, how tremendously real that verse is. Uh, that, the, that the mind without Jesus and that the mind without the Bible, and that the mind without prayer, and that the mind without the moving of the power of the Holy Ghost is full of emptiness, full of human vanity, and, and, and full of that which 
it comes and goes. You know, there's nothing permanent, uh, nothing solid about it. God wants you and me to live by our spirits uh, and to live by the Holy Ghost within us and not living in the vanity of the, of the human mind, unregenerate and not knowing the way to heaven and the way to God. The Word of God says further in Colossians 2 and 8, let no man beguile you, you know, let no man deceive you. And there are a lot of deceivers in the world today. Let no man deceive you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. You see, so, so pride, pride comes out of the, uh, the, the old Adam nature. Pride comes up out of the mind of the ungodly. It comes up out of the mind of those who don't know the Lord. And, and so when you see a person with a seemingly a great humility and telling you to worship angels or, or, or denominations or doctrines, it says uh, they become puffed up in their fleshly minds. It's not spiritual. You see, now you're seeing where problems in churches come from. You're seeing where problems in congregations and denominations come from. They come up, they come through the, the, the vanity of the inflated fleshly mind that has nothing to do with God. It's of the human nature and of the devil and has no relationship to spiritual things. And so God says, now don't do it. And then that's what we want to do. We want to walk in the spirit of our lives and not in the vanity of our soulish persons. In, in the Psalm, uh, number 94, verse 11 says, The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man, that they are, they are vanity. God knows the thoughts of man. <laughs> we think, unless we say a thing that is hidden, well, from men it might be, but not from Jehovah. God knows the thoughts of the unregenerate person, the thoughts of the unsaved person, and the, the, the thoughts of the person without God knows his thoughts that they're vain you see God knows that and so when he comes into you he, he gives you a spirit and that spirit begins to uh, over cover your mind and says mine think the ways of God think the ways of purity think the ways of holiness and I will fill you with good things such as the Word of God and such as prayer and such as praise and such as fellowship I will fill you with these good things that will cause you not to have the vanity of being puffed up uh, within your own, with your, in your own mind. In the Proverbs, the wise man Solomon said these words to the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord. <laughs> you better believe it. Always have been. Always will be. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord. But the words of the pure are pleasant words. And so in our mind, where we have our thoughts, that they're of the ungodly, that their thoughts are an abomination to God. They are unreal to God. Uh, they, they are so sinful before the Lord. God cannot accept them. God will not accept them. And if we want God to do something great for us and good for us, then we have to move into this area of saying, listen, my mind, my mind must be subject uh, to, to God. And I, so I, one of the avenues of our solical our being, the chemistry of the soul, has to do with the mind that we're dealing with. And uh, we should get into the other areas of it, into the word emotion. Into the emotion, uh, then we come to the heart of man. What is the heart of man anyway? Uh, it is an organ, a part of the soul, like other organs of the body. Uh, death comes if it does not function, uh, just like the kidneys or the liver, the lungs, and, and you know, that way. Uh, but uh, that's the heart of man. And... Uh, Proverbs 23 and 7 says, As a man thinketh in his heart, thinketh in his heart, so he is. And, and, uh, and, and so as a man uh, thinks all the time in his heart, his in his emotions, as a man dominates his emotions, as a man promotes his emotions, whatever his emotions indicate, that's what that man is. God said that's what that man is. Now, in Jeremiah 4 and 14, it says, God says, Jerusalem, Wash thine heart from wickedness. That's your, in your emotional area. That thou mayest be saved. How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? So God put the mind and the emotions together. They're, they're, they're two solical elements and they're bound together like a chain. And God put the two of them together. That your emotions and your mind, your mind says it and your emotions do it. 
And that's the, one of the other areas of your solical being. Jesus said in Matthew 9 and 4, Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? <laughs> in your hearts, you see? Their, their, their emotions were, ever see a man get angry? Well, his mind told him to do it, you see? So the, the, the human mind and the human emotions, they flow together. The mind says to the emotions, look angry. Let your eyes look angry. Let your face look angry. And, and uh, let your words sound angry, you see. And, and Jesus said, uh, why think you evil in your hearts? It, the emotions were showing it forth. He also said in Matthew 15 and 19, for out of the heart proceed evil. Out of the heart, out of the emotions, proceeds murders. Adulteries coming up out of your emotional being. Fornication, thefts. I'll take this. Thefts. False witness, blasphemies. Jesus said this. These are the things that come up out of that great, vast world dimension of the emotional uh, part of a human being uh, that is part of his Adamic nature, part of his solical being, that if it is not tamed, if it is not controlled, if it is not dominated by the spirit, the born-again nature of man, it will lead him the wrong way every time in the whole universe. There, there are no places where it does not do that. In Genesis 6 and 5, God said that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now that is what God, that is what God had to say. Now you say, but now what happens to that heart uh, when it comes over to God. I'll tell you that in our next lesson.